Science! Welcome to part five of our new series, Humanity in Space. In the first four parts, I looked at spacesuits, spacewalks, space stations, and culminated with the International Space Station. Now, we have sent a lot of different rockets and spacecraft into space, including many different vehicles like space station parts, telescopes, and satellites. But in my opinion, none of those are as impressive as the space shuttle. Like many great ideas in space exploration, the space shuttle finds its roots way before we even ever made it to space. In the 1930s, Germany was pursuing an idea called Silber Vogel, which would be a reusable winged rocket that could fly into suborbital space and then back into the stratosphere, allowing it to make a trip across the Atlantic Ocean by actual leaps and bounds. The end result was to have a way to bomb America in light of the war. But like many outlandish ideas Germany had during that time, this one too never became a reality. After much of the science developed during the war came over to America as part of Operation Paperclip, the U.S. military and NACA, which would later become NASA in 1958, started to pursue a reusable space plane idea, and eventually the X-15 was born. The X-15 set speed and altitude records in the early 1960s, reaching the edge of outer space and returning with data that was essential to the development of future high-speed vehicles, particularly those intended to fly back into the atmosphere, such as the space shuttle. Today, the X-15 still holds the record for the fastest speed ever reached by a piloted rocket power airplane. In the 1960s, the U.S. Air Force began working on the X-20, or the Dinosaur. This was a space plane, meant for reconnaissance and satellite maintenance and most closely resembled the space shuttle in design. But unfortunately, this project was canceled and the plane was never fully created. At the same time, the U.S. Air Force and NASA were pursuing lifting bodies, planes that had fixed wings and the lift was actually generated by the fuselage. These early designs directly informed how the space shuttle would come to function. NASA officially announced the reusable space shuttle program in 1968. In fact, they created the Space Shuttle Task Group to figure out the correct design, functionality, and reusability of the craft. NASA actually reviewed 29 potential designs for the space shuttle. They determined that a design with two side boosters should be used and the boosters should be reusable to reduce costs. In January of 1972, President Richard Nixon approved the space shuttle program and NASA decided on its final design in March of that year. In 1974, construction began on the very first shuttle, Orbital Vehicle 101, which would later be named Enterprise. Enterprise was designed as a test vehicle and did not include engines or heat shielding. Construction was completed in 1976 and Enterprise was moved to Edwards Air Force Base to begin testing. Enterprise underwent flight testing with the shuttle carrier aircraft, a Boeing 747 that had been modified to carry the orbiter. In February of 1977, Enterprise began the approach and landing tests and underwent captive flights, where it remained attached to the shuttle carrier aircraft for the duration of the flight. But then in August of 1977, Enterprise conducted its first glide test, where it detached from the shuttle carrier aircraft and landed at Edwards Air Force Base. The space shuttle program was supposed to be done the following year, but NASA experienced significant delays in the development of the space shuttle's thermal protection system. NASA chose to use ceramic tiles for thermal protection as the shuttle could then be constructed of lightweight aluminum and the tiles could be individually replaced as needed. At this same time, construction began on Columbia in 1975, and it was delivered to Kennedy Space Center in 1979. The first space shuttle mission, STS-1, would be the first time NASA performed a crewed first flight of this spacecraft. On April 12, 1981, the space shuttle launched for the first time and was piloted by NASA astronauts John Young and Robert Crippen. During that two-day mission, Young and Crippen tested equipment on board the shuttle and found several of the ceramic tiles had fallen off the top side of Columbia during launch. On July 4, 1982, STS-4, flown by astronauts Ken Mattingly and Henry Hartsfield, landed at Edwards Air Force Base. President Ronald Reagan and his wife Nancy met the crew and delivered a speech. So after STS-4, NASA declared the space shuttle program operational. The space shuttle program was a feat of human ingenuity and engineering. 
and the entire system can be broken down into three parts, the external tank, the solid rocket boosters, and the parts of the space shuttle itself that all amount to what is called the orbiter. At launch, the external tank was connected to two solid rocket boosters, SRBs, that provided over 70% of the space shuttle's thrust. These were the largest solid rocket motors ever flown and the first solid rocket motors used on a crewed spacecraft. These two 150-foot tall rockets would be jettisoned two minutes after launch to parachute back to Earth and be recovered in the ocean. The external tank had a main function to supply the solid rocket boosters with liquid oxygen and hydrogen. The external tank was the only part of the shuttle system that was never reused. For the first two missions, STS-1 and STS-2, the external tank was actually painted white to protect the insulation that covers much of the tank. But improvements and testing showed that this was not required. The weight saved by not painting the tank resulted in an increase in payload capability to orbit. The orbiter was the spacecraft itself, and five models were produced and sent to space. Columbia, Challenger, Discovery, Atlantis, and Endeavour. Enterprise paved the way, but was never flown into orbit. The orbiter had design elements and capabilities of both a rocket and an aircraft to allow it to launch vertically and then land like a glider. The shuttle had to be carefully constructed and also maneuvered while it was within the Vehicle Assembly Building or VAB Building in Kennedy Space Center. There are still guidelines on the floor to show just how far you could turn the shuttle and still get it outside the door. The crew compartment of the shuttle comprised three decks and was the pressurized habitable area on all space shuttle missions. The cockpit consists of two seats for the commander and pilot, as well as an additional two to four seats for crew members. The mid-deck was located below the cockpit and is where the galley and crew bunks are set up, as well as three or four crew member seats. The mid-deck also contained the airlock, which could support two astronauts on an EVA, as well as access to pressurized research modules. The orbiter's 60-foot-long payload bay, comprising most of the fuselage, could accommodate cylindrical payloads up to 15 feet in diameter. Information declassified in 2011 showed that these measurements were chosen specifically to accommodate the KH-9 Hexagon Spy Satellite operated by the National Reconnaissance Office. Way back in 1973, European ministers met in Belgium to authorize Western Europe's crewed orbital project and its main contribution to the space shuttle, the Space Lab program. Space Lab would provide a multidisciplinary orbital space laboratory and additional space equipment for the shuttle. Supported by a modular system of pressurized modules, pallets, and systems, Space Lab missions executed on multidisciplinary science, orbital logistics, and international cooperation. Over 29 missions flew on subjects including astronomy, microgravity, radar, and life sciences, and even the Hubble Space Telescope was part of the Space Lab hardware. In the 1980s and 1990s, many flights involved space science missions on the Space Lab, or launching various types of satellites and science probes. By the late 90s and 2000s, the focus shifted more to servicing the space station with fewer satellite launches. Almost the entire space shuttle re-entry procedure, except for lowering the landing gear and deploying the air data probes, was normally performed under computer control. The re-entry could be flown entirely manually if an emergency arose. Here retired NASA astronaut Nicole Stott talk about her time flying on the space shuttle. Nicole was actually the final expedition member to leave the International Space Station and come back to Earth on a space shuttle during mission STS-129. And she also was part of the third to last ever space shuttle mission, STS-133. The space shuttle, what was the space shuttle, I hope we figure out how to do something as beautiful as the space shuttle again. You know, yeah. the space shuttle launched from a launch pad and glided in to landing uh. on the runway. And, you know, the launch on the shuttle was really dynamic. I mean, yeah. more than I, after watching launches for years working out there, ever imagined. I mean, I thought it was going to be like here and, you know, I can't even stretch my arm high enough right, right. for how you know, your body is like jello shaking on, oh, the, on the way up. And, um, but it's outstanding. And, you know, the, just a little detour here, but the, on launch, uh, the, nothing prepares you for it, I don't think. And then you do it again thinking, oh, you know, been there, done that. And it's like a whole new experience all over again. Oh, and 
I don't know if our engineers who designed the shuttle did this deliberately or not, but in about the first minute and a half, there's not a whole lot the crew can do, you know, about anything. You monitor systems. There's, you know, some things, you know, immediate switches you can throw and stuff. But for the most part, you're in monitor mode. And, And I think that was such a good thing because... That first minute and a half, it goes by so quickly. And the whole time you're just like, the smile is across your face. Yeah. inside the helmet. You're high-fiving with a guy. <laughs> next and, you know, woohooing and stuff because it just, I think it just drives it out of you. It's about, you know, talk about human experience. Oh, I mean, it gosh. just comes out of you then. And so that, that's really dynamic on the shuttle. The, the, the landing on a space shuttle was, it was like graceful and peaceful and, and yeah. And it was almost kind of this contrast because, you know, once you start entering the atmosphere and if you can get a view out a window, I mean, you're seeing that heat and, um, you know, some of the plasma yeah. kind of moving across the vehicle that you're like, Oh wow, it is really hot out there. <laughs> <laughs> and you know, you're going super fast and, and but it just was inside, you know, just a little bit of a rumble every now and then, but no, you know, no dynamics at all, like like launch. And then when you land, it's just this circling kind of S turn and spiral into the runway, and and you're gliding. You're not even on engines anymore. I mean, you know, wow. the key there is you got one. You know, it's one time you right. land. You're going around, and it was just this you know, a little screechy noise on the runway, and then you're home. It was so, so mellow. The space shuttle program became the staple of modern space exploration in the face of NASA during the 80s and 90s. Two disasters, though, leave black marks on its almost flawless record, and through those terrible tragedies, NASA was able to learn from their unfortunate mistakes. On January 28th, 1986, the space shuttle Challenger disintegrated 73 seconds after launch. The explosion killed all seven crew members and was felt among all walks of life as one of the crew members was Sharon Krista McAuliffe, an American teacher turned astronaut and became the every woman of the crew. Many schools across the world tuned into the launch as a way to show students the idea of you can be anything. The failure was in one of the rocket's O-ring connectors that was warned to be faulty by NASA engineers if launched in unfavorable temperatures, and the warnings, unfortunately, were not heeded by NASA managers. On February 1st, 2003, Columbia disintegrated on re-entry, killing its entire crew. There was damage to the wing during launch, and again, NASA management ignored warnings from engineers that the damage should be looked at closely and repaired before re-entry. Both of these tragedies paved the way for better understanding between management and workers within the NASA program, and many steps were taken to ensure safer and better procedures moving forward, including having better checks and balances, and also better safety measures and spacesuit designs being implemented for astronauts. Recently, Kennedy Space Center in Florida unveiled an incredible memorial to the men and women who lost their lives in these disasters, which really puts a human element on the brave astronauts that risked their lives still to this day to further space exploration. There were many giant leaps for mankind thanks to the missions under the space shuttle program. STS-30 was the first space shuttle mission to launch an interplanetary probe and the space shuttle Atlantis brought Magellan to space and launched it to Venus. The launch of the Hubble telescope, which still to this day gives us incredible views of our galaxy and beyond, was part of the STS-31 mission of the Space Shuttle Discovery. The longest Space Shuttle mission was in 1996 on the Space Shuttle Columbia, and it lasted 17 days and 15 hours. Space Shuttle Endeavour in 1998 brought the first pieces of the International Space Station to space. The space shuttle program ended in 2011. There are a few ways to view the decommissioned shuttles, but none are as impressive as the Atlantis experience at the Kennedy Space Center in Florida. To be able to immerse yourself in the history and science involved in the space shuttle directly under the shuttle Atlantis as it hangs exactly like it would have in space is awe-inspiring and breathtaking. Since the space shuttle program ended, Only the Soyuz has been the sole spacecraft to deliver astronauts to and from space. And as we look towards the future, new craft are emerging 
both the Orion and Crew Dragon capsule are the, on the forefront of the next crewed spacecraft taking astronauts to space. And still, in my opinion, nothing has been impressive looking or functionality as the space shuttle. And as we move into the future of space exploration, I think we're going to see a lot of new designs and some that might even surpass what the space shuttle was as we look towards ferrying more astronauts into space as our return to the moon and beyond to Mars and into the stars.